So welcome to a special edition of Intersections. I'm John Ko, and I have the special pleasure of hosting today Katya Drozdova, who is uh, a, a, has a resume that is so long that it would take all of our time simply to review it. Uh, I think you'll see why she is the guest of honor at the moment if I share some uh, salient facts with you. She's a professor of political science in the School of Business, Government, and Economics at Seattle Pacific University with diverse uh, academic backgrounds from Stanford and uh, NYU. Her expertise is in cyber uh, matters, international relations, uh, cybersecurity, cyber terrorism, foreign policy, counterterrorism, US uh, um, national security, with particular reference, I uh, point out to uh, American-Russian uh, relations and um, all of the issues that are now implicated in the, the global scene. Um, Katya and I are part of a group called Pathfinders, which is always attempting to go behind the headlines and to understand more deeply what's uh, going on. And uh, I think no one, uh, no situation uh, requires that more than current events in the Ukraine, which as she just pointed out before we started um, the formal uh, interview, uh, events are changing there on a moment to moment basis. So anything we say is kind of like um, putting a stick in a flowing river and uh, circumstances are, are very dynamic. But a little bit knowledge is, and a little insight is certainly better than none or the kind of generic newscaster level of discussion that's been going on. So Katya, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your uh, perspective and your insights and your wisdom with us. Thank you, John, my pleasure. Thank you for the kind introduction. And it's a pleasure to speak with you always, uh, but also uh, a tremendous opportunity to share ideas with with your audience and we really need all minds and uh, creative, innovative thinking in, uh, in addressing this challenge. I think it's here for the long term. So thank you for the opportunity to discuss with you. Indeed, well, let me turn the floor over to you and um, ask you a, a, an opening question, which is how are you putting this all together? You know, you have a specialty which is going beneath what is obvious to kind of deconstruct and decode the subtext and the layers, you know, sort of we've talked about the Russian doll uh, dynamics often that what you see is not necessarily what uh, the complete story in terms of what's going on. So how do you how do you put together the current situation? How did we get here and where do you think it's going? Mm -hmm. Well, um, we need the Sherlock Holmes approach, the art of deduction. Um, and that is, you know, logic and evidence, but um, Evidence is hard to come by. I think uh, the sources, there are lots of sources of information, but many are being jammed um, as well. And accurate information is hard to come by. Uh, so we, in the situation, is, is very, very dynamic, as, uh, as you mentioned. So one needs to try to understand and think in context. I think we got here, well, on the one hand, it's a big surprise. Right. Many people did not expect actual military action. And uh, if we expected some action, maybe prior experience suggested that it might be something in the cyber domain or something sort of more um, updated for the 21st century. We're seeing that certainly, but also more traditional. Um, on the other hand, this has been in the works uh, since at least the collapse of the Soviet Union and uh, Russian leadership expecting security guarantees, asking for security guarantees, and in particular, um, uh, being upset about the gradual and sometimes quite not so gradual movement of NATO forces toward Russia's borders. And that's uh, one of the official explanations, but I think in, in strategic thinking kind of perspective, um, uh, it's, it's there. It's there and something triggered actual action. We can, we can try to guess by now, uh, but certainly uh, Western support for more countries in, in Central and Eastern Europe moving closer toward Russia and the situation around Ukraine that has been developing since 2014 has led us uh, here. And you, do you see a specific trigger event or is it just uh, uh, the straw that broke the camel's back? You know, not terribly obvious, but 
except in hindsight that there's this trend? Uh, yeah, well, we'll have to see what happens. Usually uh, the leadership of Russia is playing a multiplayer complex chess game where the moves are not always obvious until later. Um, certainly, they waited until the end of the Olympics in China, and that was probably, you know, a polite move. Uh, usually Olympics or big events in the world is a good time to invade a country because, you know, everyone's busy. That uh, we've seen that with Afghanistan and, and Georgia and various other places. A um, couple of other things. Uh, the pandemic hasn't quite ended, but really, I, I think, has been on the slowdown, and that has been the priority for everyone, but perhaps cleared the uh, the table a little bit by now. Uh, what else? There have been internal developments in Russia with the constitutional revisions and various other laws being passed that essentially stabilized uh, an opportunity for President Putin to run at least twice more and the term is six years. So that has established a potential uh, domestic stability of opportunity. Um, and otherwise, it's a little bit hard. I think we're not seeing everything yet. Uh, perhaps the, uh, the, I mean, the Russia really needed the Nord Stream approved, the gas pipeline uh, through Germany going uh, toward Europe. And that was in the works. Perhaps they got some information that that wasn't happening and they had to make a power move. I don't know. We don't have that information, uh, although, it's hard to see how that could be achieved with the current situation. Perhaps something happened behind the scenes Why right now, but there are certainly conditions in place that made it a more amenable time to move. And in terms of the larger motivation, uh, how much uh, stock should we put in this grand vision of restoring the, the Russian empire, you know, Rusky Mirror? And um, how long has that been in the works? That's actually something that's been uh, on, on the table now for centuries. This is not just a recent phenomenon, right? The return of the glory of that empire. How important is that? And how, you know, when, when Putin talks about um, the, the restoration of Orthodox Christianity and the, the morality of uh, this um, misbegotten military adventure, how much credence should we put in that? I mean, is that sort of um, heartfelt or is that uh, a, co a cover layer. Um, I mean, is that meant to kind of uh, rally public opinion among the, let's say, the less sophisticated, um, you know, citizens in, in uh, that who are supporting him? Uh, or does he really believe this? Does he go to bed at night, you know, believing that he's the savior of the Russian Empire, you know, the glory of the Russian Empire? Well, John, we don't know in the end. Um, that certainly is a long story. Um, it seems to me the decisions are much more strategic and much more oriented toward the 21st century. But it also seems inconsistent in that context to, to really deny the business opportunities that I think leaders of Russia have been really benefiting from. And now with sanctions, those uh, venues are being shut down for them. Uh, so the story of Russia and Christianity has played since Crimea, at least, uh, with the explanation that about a thousand years ago, the leader of old Rus back then, uh, which had its capital in Kiev, of course, uh, but Russia traces its roots from that as well. And so the leader, Prince Vladimir then, as the story goes, uh, was baptized in Crimea, and that was the beginning of Russian Christianity and in Russia, and with Eastern Orthodox Christianity more broadly, uh, religion is much uh, tighter connected with politics, and it was used as an organizing form for, for ruling the country. Uh, of course, it's a multi-faith, uh, multi-cultural, multi-ethnic country, lots of other religions are uh, present, and at least uh, Judaism, Buddhism, and uh, Islam are recognized along with Eastern Orthodox Christianity as traditional religions. Uh, but of course, that story plays. Mm, it's probably a combination, but we know Russian leadership is, is very good at uh, crafting arguments, not always, but in general, to support the most. It's amazing to see the power of religion Right now, I mean, there was a remarkable video of a, 
a caravan of uh, vehicles with the uh, the body of a fallen Ukrainian soldier and scores of people falling to their knees as the um, caravan went by. Uh, so it, it is powerful uh, uh, as an underlying force, for sure. But it sounds like what you're saying is that there's more of this pragmatism of um, how to be mighty in the 21st century, um, uh, you know, as the thought process, um, perhaps coupled then with this, this notion of, um, uh, if not paranoia, at least anxiety about the encroachment of Western military force um, around. Uh, I mean, if you look at the map, pr the pre-war map, and you put yourself in the shoes of a Russian leader, you are essentially surrounded by um, on the on the west by um, NATO forces moving closer and closer to your border, uh, being better and better supplied, being more and more economically integrated. Um, it's not dissimilar, actually, from the situation that China faces, where it's surrounded by a group of uh, Western supported democracies, I would argue, uh, you know, ranging from South Korea to Singapore and so forth and so on, that also represent this kind of um, encroachment in a way on what should otherwise be a sphere of, uh, of influence. Um, how big a deal is this Russian empire meme, this, this notion of the restoration of the glory of Russia? I mean, that, that is, seems to be a big deal, at least in the the public speeches and so forth and so on, um, and and provides the moral rationale, even though it, it's sort of paradoxical. It's like, you know, you wanna woo someone to be yours, but you do that by essentially uh, assaulting them violently. You know, it's not, you know, dating 101 would suggest this is not the right strategy. Well, that may not be quite the framework, but certainly it looks inconsistent. I think the more direct moral rationale that was presented had to do with Donetsk and Lugansk and areas around there, uh, which are primarily Russian speaking, culturally much more Russian oriented and were the areas really built up by the Soviet Union, which you know combined uh, everyone under, under one, one roof and the leadership from Moscow uh, as an industrial, area and that area in the beginning okay looking back to 2014 plus or minus uh wanted federalism wanted some some independence uh, which you know in america when we talk about federalism that's one of the constitutional principles but in other countries uh, we see it differently um, they weren't granted that they felt slighted they felt some laws required abandoning even the russian language and so essentially that area has been in a state of war. And so the specific moral rationale that uh, President Putin gave was, you know, let's go defend these people who are really our people and are not, you know, are, are, are not being protected by the country of which they are a part. But then of course, he, and so at first he said, it's going to be a peacekeeping operation, but then it went much, much further. Um, the Russian Empire, I mean, that has all kinds of implications. I think that phrase in particular probably won't play well in the 21st century, but uh, the 21st century just changed. Uh, yeah. But I think the, the, the context, the strategic context you mentioned is key, and that is the movement of uh, NATO forces, uh, Western forces, economic, political, military, closer to Russian borders. That's, uh, that's a strategic threat that most major powers recognize as a threat. And, and I would call it, uh, Russia a major power in the context of a nuclear weapons armed power who has a lot of play in global markets, even though the economy is, is hampered you know, with energy and some of the other resources and wants to be a global player. So traditionally Russia, whether the Soviet Union or the Russian empire had solved these problems with some buffer zones, essentially, you know, either acquiring reuniting, annexing, however you call it, a territory, or uh, creating, you know, states, communist states in the past, for example, or other kinds of states that may look independent, but really are aligned with Moscow. Uh, so perhaps there's a way out of there with some kind of a buffer state, uh, buffer area solution, um, but we don't 
in the Donetsk, Lugansk, Eastern Ukraine area, but we don't really know how that's going to play out and what the people on the ground want. And, and of course, the Ukrainian government is not going to settle for that. So that's a big job. Well, the positions have hardened. You know, I mean, there probably was a scenario where a limited um, agreement might have led to, uh, with a Russian show, uh, leveraged by a Russian show of force, might have decided the issue, even though, as I understand it, while it's Russian speaking and Russian affiliated, um, there was a fair amount of ambivalence in the populations there as to whether to lean west or to lean east. So, you know, at the citizen level, that issue was not um, by any means uh, clear cut. Um, you, you said uh, uh, when we were chatting before we uh, started the program that you saw a few, uh, maybe three overarching non-obvious um, uh, themes that were beginning to emerge from what is obviously a really chaotic and dynamic situation. I wonder if you could share your thoughts about that. Thank you. Yes, well, I was thinking in the context of your program, you know, innovation, we are really in need of uh, some strategic thinking here that's innovative in terms of security strategies and architectures. What we've had up until now is clearly crumbling and it potentially dragging the world into World War III. That's not going to be good for anyone. Um, in Ukraine, I want to say before I launch to the themes, it's a strategic conundrum for the world because of that situation of it being in the middle with a lot of internal confrontation as well as confrontation with Russia, as well as in the context of the global major power. Uh, controversy. And it's a human tragedy. Many people, it's a huge human tragedy huge, for, for the people. Human tragedy, yes. Yes. Uh, I mean, of course, in terms of violence, but many people on all sides of this conflict have family, friends, colleagues on all sides, and they are being torn apart and disconnected. And, and those are the people who would be the grassroots builders of peace who right now, um, as a result of the action of the militaries as well as in, in the Russian move, of course, but also as a result of sanctions and you know businesses leaving mm -hmm. the area and social networks being disconnected or jammed. So, so that's the context. Um, let's see. Accurate information is hard to come by. Um, I'm seeing three trends that are long-term that I don't think are being addressed but need to be considered as part of possible constructive solutions. Let me name them and then dive in as deeply as, as you see right. uh, the appropriate in our context. So one, in a rush to sanction Russia, uh, back to Bolshevism. I think uh, we're creating a global economic slump that is hurting everyone, is preventing post-COVID recovery and it's going to be very, very difficult to get out of. Uh, this is on top of a couple of years of the world essentially being disconnected right, mm -hmm. due to the pandemic. There's a side thing here we might pursue later on and that is perhaps China is benefiting from this a lot among others, which is a concern you know, for the United States and others. So one, global economic slump, hurting everyone. Two, uh, the emerging cyber Siberia chill. I'm not sure if that's the right metaphor yet, but I'm working on a metaphor for the iron curtain for the 21st century. Okay, and the cyber Siberia, and that's the idea that the world really is disconnected. Uh, social networks are leaving as a result of sanctions or their stance or are being banned uh, by the Russian government. And it's a, you know, it's a combination. Um, and there has been a law passed that essentially says that, well, it's a law against fake news on the face of it, against uh, portraying the actions of the Russian military in an incorrect way. But what that means in effect is that any point of view that doesn't agree with the official point of view is at risk of falling under that law. Uh, and uh, there, there are criminal implications for that and, uh, and incarceration implications. So radio stations, TV channels, online channels, newspapers are going offline or either because they're banned or because you know, they have enough integrity not to be able to uh, just report the one side, various combinations. 
um, some have stopped reporting on the conflict at all or are reporting kind of a very scrapped version. So I think that's a big potential problem for everyone because on the one hand that, you know, the idea of the sanctions is to change the policy of the Russian government. That hasn't happened yet. They're not being effective yet. The idea of this um, information blockade is supposed to be part of that. But it is denying regular people the opportunity to speak. It is denying the world the opportunity to get some alternative perspectives. I mean, accurate information or at least some alternative perspectives. We used to believe in this democratizing power of the internet and social networks and people are very savvy, cyber savvy in Russia. They would know how to get around. But now, you know, the major ones, Meta, you know, Facebook, Instagram, various other services are, are being shut oh. down to them. So that's number two, cyber severity. How do we get out of that? And that's hurting everyone as well. And I think that's preventing opportunities for grassroots organizing for peace. And number three, uh, foreign fighters. What foreign fighters? Foreign, foreign fighters. fighters. You know that term mm -hmm. from international security war on terror. Uh, that's a big problem that hasn't been solved in that context yet, counterterrorism. Uh, but foreign fighters pouring into Ukraine, first at the invitation of the Ukrainian government. Now Russia has responded with the same. They're recruiting actively in Syria. Who knows where Ukraine is recruiting? Uh, who knows who's going there? And I'm saying that with the, the best wishes for, you know, for resolving this. Now, this is exacerbating risks of terrorism potentially, because who is going? Um, there are some, shall we say, jihadists out of work or, or you know, missing some battles. Or there are some people looking for a thrill. There are people with different grievances who enjoy a fight. Um, those units are going to be very difficult to control, whichever side they're on. They bring their own problems into the heart of Europe, into a nuclear armed situation. Well, Ukraine is not nuclear armed, as we know, uh, although they're, they're talking about it, uh, but there are nuclear power plants, there are certainly uh, resources, but the confrontation of the global powers. So foreign fighters is a situation that I don't think is being tracked as a potential threat and risk in this context, but I'm, I believe we need to think about it because that's going to be very hard to solve. Um, for everyone. So those are the three, um, economic slump, cyber Siberia disconnect, and foreign fighters counterterrorism potential angle. Well, that's quite a menu. And, you know, maybe uh, as you suggested, if we're, um, uh, if you, you know, if you have the, uh, uh, the time, uh, each one of those would be a topic to delve into more deeply. Um, uh, I'm particularly interested right now, you know, I was just this morning uh, sketching, going back to my, um, uh, my Marshall McLuhan uh, from the 1960s, you know, the, the understanding media and media is the massage uh, books. And, you know, what really strikes me about the constriction of the information environment, what you're calling the cyber Siberia, is that um, Russia is going back to a form of media of the 1950s, which is television, and specifically broadcast television that, uh, you know, we used to have six channels uh, before everything exploded. And, you know, the implications of a television world as opposed to an internet media world are that you have uh, lavishly produced experiences that uh, are presented to a passive audience with no opportunity really for uh, interaction and uh, no uh, opportunity really for any critical thinking because they're uh, not necessarily going to be a variety of viewpoints, which is why, you know, you trust Walter Cronkite, um, uh, who apparently was um, uh, voted uh, by the uh, opinion polls as someone most people would want to see as president of the United States because he was so trustworthy. And um, so 
it's it's a medium that's ideally suited for propaganda, authoritarianism, and uh, you know dictatorial hierarchical environments. You know, you have people in the command module control controlling the narrative and telling stories, and um, then you have a populace that consumes it. And you know, television also in America is kind of you know the consumption of traditional television is inversely correlated with age and education and things of this kind. I mean, not. Uh, not uh, the streaming revolution to the side, you know, whereas internet media, I mean, the fact that it seems to me, uh, I'd love to, you know, get your thoughts about this. Um, the, the reason that things are so robust in terms of the Ukrainian response is partly because there's this youth culture of internet media and um, kind of decentralized uh, co command and, you know, non-command non and coordination and control in the field and the ability to innovate a wide range of social services on the fly and to fill in the gaps, right? And, and that even extends to what's going on in the battlefield in terms of you know, the Soviet model of hierarchy and um, you know, uh, kind of tell the troops only what they absolutely need to know to function you know, in the field, um, as opposed to the incredibly rich information flow within uh, the, the Ukrainian environment. So I wonder what you think about that in terms of, um, you know, in a way, Russia turning back the clock to almost this um, 1950s uh, centralized media, right? And that that really defining, in a way, cyber Siberia, uh, in a way that has enormous implications. Because what person under the age of 35 in Russia would want to go back to a television world? For just as one point, uh, I do want to emphasize it's not one sided. I think everyone is involved. The sanctions are driving a lot of this departure of various mm. platforms or opportunities for them to work there, uh, as well as the Russian government. Uh, mm. So I think some of our sanctions created for particular purposes are generating the problem and maybe making it worse in some areas. So right. there's a need to, to think about that. Um, second thing I would say, I. My understanding is that the populace in Russia is, is quite inoculated against uh, propaganda, of, okay, by and large. Uh, coming out of the Soviet Union, um, of course, the, gen the post-Soviet generation has grown up already, but um, they remember that you have to you know, interpret official news in a certain mm. way and learn to read between the lines, and uh, people are quite adept at that. Uh, I think it's exacerbating the tragedy for the people there. Many people have been arrested trying to demonstrate, many people disagree, uh, but they are losing, they're being shut out of the world. Uh, physically, because you, you know, flights are being canceled, planes, licenses are not being renewed, you know, that kind of situation, plus communication wise. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's going to create kind of a, I think more turning towards the governments because where else are you going to turn? The West is abandoning us. We thought we were integrated, but what now? Mm -hmm. And this comes on uh, on the feet of uh, NATO experience in Afghanistan, which we don't talk about anymore. And, and I see it in part of after all. I'm sorry, we don't talk. Uh, you faded out for just a second. We don't talk about what? Oh, Afghanistan, where where NATO oh. has proclaimed resolute support, I believe that was one of the names. And I, and I say that with a bleeding heart with many of us, I mean, yourself included, mm. have put so much work and effort in trying to assist with, with counterterrorism and rebuilding of that country. But NATO abandoned, essentially, um, that country. And so people in Russia are also thinking, well, where else are we going to turn? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think people are shifting, offic sifting official information and know how to interpret it. Of course, there's going to be a segment that follows directly, but people tend to process these things in a more sophisticated way. But it doesn't go bode well for the world. Even during the Cold War, US policy has been to reach out to the people, to try mm -hmm. to build people to people relations. Okay, uh, you mentioned something about trusting Walter. So was President Reagan's uh, trust but verify, which is actually a Russian proverb, Many people don't know. Oh, really? <laughs> yes, uh, which was part of the trend of his approach to whichever country he went to, to try mm. to learn something of the culture and use that to relate to the people. 
directly over the heads of TVs and media. Uh, so um, now we're sort of in a don't trust and do verify situation, uh, but, but cutting out the people I think is going to be a problem um, for, for trying to find constructive solutions. Hmm. What's your sense, given that you know you're not, none of us are clairvoyant about how things are going to play out over the next weeks? Mm -hmm. I mean, is there anything that can can stop the um, the storyline of turning uh, Kiev into another Grozny or uh, mm -hmm. you know? Well, I don't think it's in the interest of the Russian leadership to go quite that far. Um, but of course, the current operation didn't seem in their interest either. They don't seem to have really good, uh, they don't really seem to have good uh, um, uh, 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 command and control. I mean, even if uh, the signal emulate, emanates from the Kremlin to kind of ease off, it seems like uh, fire discipline and uh, um, coordination at the tactical level is, is rather poor. I don't so, know, John, but I don't think we have accurate information about that. Uh, I interpret, mm. I try to, you know, watch a lot of different sources and and try yeah. to interpret. Um, there, there's a lot of spin on all sides and a lot of fake news on all sides. Mm -hmm. I'm not denying that that may be happening. I'm just saying it's very right. difficult to um, to say exactly. So a couple of things. There are negotiations going on. Uh, between mm -hmm. Ukraine and Russia at the governmental levels. They've started with some working groups. Uh, they have risen to ministerial levels now. The, the foreign ministers met in, in Turkey, interesting mm -hmm. point. We discussed earlier, Turkey is, is trying to be the ground for constructive solutions for, for lots of cultural as well as political and uh, economic reasons. Um, it's not quite to the presidential level, but negotiations are going on. Traditionally, if we look at Soviet and Russian foreign policy, there's a tendency, if push comes to shove, okay, to the really big shove, there is a tendency to try to acquire, secure more than they really need and more than they really want. And then informal public negotiations look like it's, uh, look like they're giving something up look like it's a compromise, but in a sense, you know, if you have more than you need and you're giving up, strategically, you're still there, but it plays well. So something like that may be happening. Those negotiations have been um, mostly behind the scenes. So we don't know exactly what they're talking about. So that's on that side. On the side of the rest of the world, Okay, I don't mean to make light out of this, but one of the ways people cope with um, really awful situations is some sarcastic you know, humor that's hard true. We sure. might have the British um, football fans revolt on our hands. And it's what's, what's soccer in America is football there. So the oligarchs are suffering. And Mr. Roman Abramovich has essentially lost his club. And uh, apparently that's been the true love of his life. Uh, but he made the club into a champion. They just, they won the, the FIFA championship, mm -hmm. world championship just recently. And that's creating a lot of consternation. Uh, but I think it's one of the examples of the sanctions. We know how to do sanctions in the West. Okay. And we know how to do more sanctions. It's sort of a standard response. It's not necessarily working to achieve the goal of stopping the policy of the target of the sanctions, it is creating long-term problems for the rest of the world. And I think we need to consider some more innovative solutions that just more of the same, because it, the further it goes, the harder it will be to get out of the slump. And do you have any thoughts about what those might be? Uh, or well, I think we need to do some hard work on this and with okay. you at the helm as the innovator <laughs> in chief, if I may. <laughs> um, that will take some discussion and thinking, and I, I, am, I would be honored and, and happy to participate. Okay. Um, well, we, one, we would need to see what uh, the Russian and Ukrainian sides agree to. And then the United States and the West will have a decision point to support whatever Kiev agrees to if they do. Mm -hmm. Or if it looks like it's short of desired, what else to do? Mm. 
I think I uh, don't have the solutions yet, but those mm -hmm. three areas I named need to be thought through. Uh, something other than sanctions needs to be considered. And I think uh, Russia's formally stated and you know, strategically understandable desire for, uh, for security, they call it guarantees, no one can guarantee anything in this world, but for, for strategic security architecture that does not bring NATO military and other kinds of forces to its border. I think there needs to be a creative way to address that issue because I believe they will not stop uh, un until some kind of a workable solution is found. That doesn't mean giving up Ukraine, that doesn't mean you know, any knee-jerk reactions, but it means some really serious strategic thinking and innovation. How can we address, I mean, in, in strategic studies, we would call this legitimate needs of a state, right? Mm -hmm. Some legitimate, some not so, but in, in the big picture. And without compromising the, the hopes and the uh, possibilities for, for liberty, for prosperity, for cultural revival, and, and all those other good stuff, uh, things that, that we really hope for, for the people on all sides. Well, what you're saying resonates with me in, in many ways, one of which is, uh, you know, you're, we're hearing reports of, you know, anti-Russian, um, sentiment down to uh, people uh, uh, defacing Russian restaurants in New York and things of that kind. And that's not really where the, the, the conflict is. The, the conflict is not with the people of Russia or, you know, the, the Russian people that, that we've interacted with as, you know, the liberalization has occurred. Uh, it's really uh, very much about the military campaign and the motivations behind that. So, so trying to clean that up and nip that in the bud so it doesn't become a, a big us versus them and how that plays into the global economic picture, I think is super important. The other thing uh, is not everything has to be solved right now, right? I mean, um, you know, even this notion of Ukraine either, you know, saying it'll never join NATO or joining NATO tomorrow is, is not a solvable problem today. You know, maybe it's something that you put on the shelf for 10 years and certainly don't want to fight a war over. <laughs> um, so, so how uh, to prioritize what is important within this architecture that you're referring to, I think is really important. Now, how to prioritize it over time so that it's an architecture that unfolds over time, I think, uh, you know, super uh, interesting to contemplate as well from an innovation uh, perspective. Um, so um, I don't want to monopolize your entire afternoon. I, 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 what I'd like to suggest, if you're up for it, is maybe um, we digest this and identify um, a couple of specific areas that we could reconvene and delve into. I think the, the notion of the global economic slump, uh, super important, not being discussed. You know, it's kind of like um, the narrative is we're doing all of this stuff to them, but we're really doing a lot of stuff to ourselves as well with un unforeseen consequences. And, you know, the, it much as the global security architecture has been completely disrupted and is up for review, the global economic uh, architecture uh, is as well. You know, what is China's, you know, China's, I mean, that that's a whole topic unto itself as to what, you know, Xi Jinping and, you know, the people in the Politburo there are really thinking. And, you know, at the moment, nothing bad has happened to them. I mean, they still have all the assets and all the goodwill, social capital they had before, but how they choose to deploy that um, uh, over the next you know, months and, and years, I think will be su super important. So if you're up for that, maybe we can um, uh, speak offline about that agenda and, and, and just maybe conclude with a little bit of conversation about um, with 2020 hindsight, because we can at least look back over the last, a month or so, or a couple of months, mm -hmm. is there anything that could have been done uh, to either prevent or mitigate the current horrible mess that we have on our hands? Well, yes, yes. Uh, I think ever since the conflict started within Ukraine, which then spilled across borders and across you know, oceans. Ukraine has consistently been put, and that's some of, you know, their own government doing as well as 
the surrounding country has been put into a situation where they had to choose between NATO and Russia, between the European Union and between East and West in that traditional context. And there's no good choice here. Ukraine is a very um, rich, diverse, ethnically, culturally, politically diverse uh, nation, country, place in itself. Uh, religiously in various ways. And, uh, and there's a lot of disagreement among the people in terms of which way they want to go. And uh, inevitably, if you're going to push in toward one side or the other, a big segment of the country is going to be upset. Mm -hmm. And at first it was just upset and voting, but now it's a war. So I think, at, and I can remember, you know, maybe more specifics toward the next conversation, but certainly, you know, in 2014, when things started, there was a choice that they were put into the couple of presidents back. Uh, either accept the IMF fund, the U Ukraine was about to default economically and they needed funds. Mm -hmm. And uh, the IMF and the European, the Western community offered some funds, but it wasn't nearly enough. Mm -hmm. And Russia offered essentially everything they needed. And, you know, the choice of the president back then, I'm not, I'm not supporting anyone in particular, but I'm saying it was a rational choice to take what you need to prevent a default. But of course it meant siding with Russia. But why has the international community built pushing this split? Isn't there some other way? Of course, there are lots of reasons to, you know, be careful about the segments that perhaps want to be aligned with, you know, an adversary, but perhaps, and we need to think of, but, but pushing one way or the other is not going to solve the problem. So that was one, there, there were other instances I can think of where this choice was placed and whichever way you choose, it created a, a bigger problem. Uh, and of course, fighting that, in Donetsk and Lugansk was sort of fighting against your own people. And that's, that's a problem uh, for any country internally. Well, uh, do you think President Zelensky believes that intermediate status as being the right approach? And also, you know, given the fact that now uh, the country has been damaged and ravaged and savaged and people have, have been killed in great numbers, um, does that not weight the scale in a way, one way oh, or another? And I, I don't, I wouldn't call it an intermediate approach. I think we need to, it's not yet clear how the might that look mm -hmm. like and certainly sovereignty of ukraine you know it's it's a principle in the united nations sovereignty of the country i'm not suggesting any kind of split i need we need to think about it uh well president zelensky will will speak to congress tomorrow we'll see i think he's, he has oh, yeah. been a tremendous hope uh yes and he was elected of course he had no political background he is young he is uh He's been, I, I think, really an inspiration to the people, especially the way he's been behaving, you know, in these dire straits. But people chose him over everybody else because they had enough corruption. People in Ukraine had enough corruption, had enough of these failures, uh, and they really put their faith into him. Um, he's in a very, very tough situation, um, and uh, of course. You know, I'm not suggesting splitting the country in any way. I, I think we need to consider very, very carefully how, what kind of structures might be created mm -hmm. over the long term, as you suggested, that mm -hmm. might give the people in this country, and there's so many different types of people, some opportunities to live in peace so that they're not forced into kind of, you know, one constraint or the other. Uh, I remember I, it was really inspiring. Uh, part of President Zelensky's acceptance speech when he was invited I, I know your audience probably knows the story he was uh he was a comedian before i mean a businessman educated very successful with oh. his own channel uh and he played there was a tv show where he played a teacher and um and students wanted him to run for president and eventually he ran for president and won and then that happened in reality and when he was giving his acceptance speech, markedly, he walked to his inauguration. It was a very big contrast, uh, particularly looking next to the United States and, and Russia. It was very much a man of the people. And he said, in Ukrainian, but uh, Ukrainians, you know, my, my fellow citizens, 
in my past career, something I'm trying to remember the quote, but in my past career, I focused on making you laugh. Now as president, my focus will be to try to make sure that you don't have to cry. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he's, he's trying his best. Uh, mm -hmm. He can't solve this alone, but, um, but the strategic context is very, very difficult. And what's happening right now is just pushing the world into so let's think about it. I am happy to discuss more uh, and maybe we will come up with some specific solutions that can put um, yeah. better responses I mean, in motion. Absolutely. If you take all of that diversity and complexity and turn it on its head, it represents a lot of the issues that the whole planet, the whole of global civil society is dealing with. And, um, you know, uh, we like to say in the innovation field that every problem is also an opportunity. And it's a little hard to see right now, given how terrible things are. But um, what you've helped us to do is to at least be able to identify and describe the problems much more precisely. And that, you know, sets the stage for uh, maybe some innovative thinking. So let's continue. And thank you so much. This has been fantastic and look forward to uh, more conversation soon.